Welcome to cast four of our series of five webcasts covering part four of the new BSEN 62305 standard, protection against lightning, electrical and electronic systems within structures. We're now familiar with the need for the professional team to provide detailed information to allow calculation of a risk assessment, or alternatively, having to make assumptions, but realizing that where this is the case, the risk assessment process may lead to an over-engineered solution. In the last cast, we covered the main issues related to protecting the structure and people against the direct effect of a strike and consequential sparking. The last part of the standard covers the protection of the system within the structure and consequently protects against the loss of service to the public, which ultimately protects the client from loss of revenue and any potential liability arising from any loss of service. The standard approaches protection using four basic concepts and we will address each of these during this section of the cast. The first consideration is of the various lightning protection zones within the structure. These zones are theoretically assigned volume of space or rooms where the severity of the lightning electromagnetic pulse present in the zone is compatible with the impulse withstand level of the equipment enclosed within each of the zones. Coordination with equipment manufacturers is necessary as they should have the technical data to allow the lightning protection specialist to determine the various levels of protection required at the boundary of each zone. Different risks associated with R2, risk of loss of service to the public, are addressed in different ways. Some of the measures that can be used to reduce or mitigate the effects of LEMP and consequently reduce the R2, risk of loss of service to the public, will already be in place by virtue of the building fabric or the nature of the building services. The LEMP effect will be attenuated somewhat if the structure has a steel, reinforced concrete or other conductive frame and this frame is earthed. Furthermore, in zones further into the structure, LPZ2, an internal sewer room for example, if walls are constructed of metal studding or other conductive material and those are appropriately earthed, the LEMP effect may be further attenuated by virtue of these potentially inherent internal shields. Cables internal to the structure can provide their own adequate shielding by being routed through metal conduit or trunking, or being armoured or by virtue of the screening in data and telecom cables. Routing of these cables also mitigate the effect of the lamp. Where cables are routed away from the external wall of the structure or where the circuits are wired in such a way as to reduce the loops created in the circuit. These both introduce potentially inherent cost-effective means by which to further attenuate the effect of LEMP and reduce the R2 risk. The limiting effect of these measures are taken into account as part of the risk assessment process and it is important that accurate building service information is provided to the engineer undertaking the risk assessment so that it can be appropriately considered. The choice and layouts of bonding systems are crucial to the protection of electronic equipment. Each zone needs to ensure equipotentialization within it by the provision of an earth bar at the entry point to each zone. For very small installations, connecting earthing back to the bar in a radial configuration may be acceptable. In larger installations, typically greater than 12 meters squared, a meshed earthing configuration should be provided. When bonding, it is important to ensure cables from equipment to equipotential earth bars are routed as straight as possible. Avoid introducing loops and keep the connections from the earth bars onto the main earthing system as short as possible, preferably 0.5 metres maximum. Where this is not possible, two conductors should be run in parallel, following the shortest route possible, avoiding large loops and sharp bends in order to reduce the voltage drop along the length of the conductors. Of course, it is important to ensure that equipotential bonding is provided between incoming services and the internal building services by means of Type 1 lightning current surge protection devices. This bonding surge protection device may not provide protection of electronic systems and is there to prevent dangerous potentials being developed and causing sparking in the event of a strike. It is important to ensure that these equipotential bonding surge protection devices are of the same level of protection as the structural lightning protection. The final measure of protection for your electronics takes the form of coordinated surge protection devices. So, let's look at a typical generic installation. 
covering power only for ease of explanation, where a structure is fitted with a level 3 structural protection system. It is important to select a type 1, level 3 stroke 4 to match the level of structural protection, equipotential bonding, surge protection device for the main distribution board. This will offer equipotentialization between the building services and the incoming service at the point of entry into the structure. Assuming that the equipment within Lightning Protection Zone 2 has withstand voltage levels above approximately 600 volts, the typical let-through voltage of a Type 2 enhanced surge protection device, then simply applying a Type 2 enhanced over-voltage surge protection device to the sub-distribution board at the boundary of Lightning Protection Zone 1 and Lightning Protection Zone 2 may suffice, but particular system details will be required in order to validate this statement. It is important that whilst the basic principles discussed may be appropriate, the characteristics of each installation and the type of surge protection device proposed are taken into account in order to ensure that the basic principles are adequate or if more detailed research and input is required. The same principles apply to other lines such as data communications and telecommunications. It is recognised, however, that the current transmitted on these types of lines will be significantly less than on power systems, and as such, the current handling capability of these devices needs to be much less than those for power. Where lines enter the structure from other buildings, or from equipment sited outside the structure, these need to be considered for the provision of Type 1 or 2 surge protection devices to comply with equipotential requirements of Part 3 of the standard, and also for the provision of coordinated surge protection devices to offer protection to the electronic equipment in compliance with part four of the standard. It is difficult to be definitive regarding protection by surge protection devices as each environment and structure offers different characteristics and so each should be viewed in its own right and protection determined on a bespoke basis. It is important to liaise with the equipment providers regarding impulse withstand levels and system characteristics. This enables appropriate selection of surge protection devices to ensure continued uninterrupted operation of the systems to be protected and optimum operation of the surge protection devices. If you require input on your coordinated surge protection requirements, then please contact us. For further information, we have recorded a concluding section which summarises the process of providing a lightning protection design together with a discussion regarding the information that you should expect to be available from a competent lightning protection contractor.